Greetings as we gather today on our Monday Thursday worship service here at Mount Horeb Lutheran Church. I am Pastor Ralph Hill, and it's good to greet you today as we celebrate together this time where we would um, gather for Monday Thursday. So we'll begin this way. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have all heard God's call to struggle against sin and death and the devil, all these things that keep us from loving God and each other. And this is the struggle to which we were called in our baptism. So on this Monday, Thursday, we remember God's saving act of the Exodus, which is where the Passover meal comes from, and of the cross as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we hear a new command or a mandate as a new motivation for our life, a life of service and love. Jesus says to his disciples then and to you and me as disciples today, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and of giving the peace of reconciliation. So on this night, we confess our sin as we begin this service against God, our sin against neighbor, and we enter into the celebration of the great three days, reconciled with God and with one another. Let us begin with a word of forgiveness and prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And now God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. So by grace, you have been saved. And in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are now forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your heart through faith. Amen. So I want to share with you now the readings for, that are set aside for Monday, Thursday, and I'll read all four of them. The first reading is from Exodus in the 12th chapter. And in this passage, we remember that Israel remembered its delivery from slavery in Egypt by celebrating the Passover. And this festival featured the Passover lamb, whose blood was used as a sign to protect God's people from the threat of death. And the early church described the Lord's Supper using imagery from the Passover, especially in portraying Jesus as the lamb who delivers God's people from sin and death. And now the reading. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. And if a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. And the lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. And then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the house, which they eat it. And they shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled or in water, but roasted over the fire with its heads and legs and inner organs. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until morning you shall burn, and this is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, And when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you, and you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Through your generations, you shall observe it in perpetual ordinance. And here ends the first reading. 
Our second reading is from the psalm. It's Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2 and 12 to 19. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of all your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid, and you have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. A second reading then is from 1 Corinthians in the 11th chapter, verses 23 to 26. And so Paul writes in this letter about in the bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper, we experience uh, intimate fellowship with Christ and with one another because it involves his body given for us and the new covenant in his blood. Faithful participation in this meal is a living proclamation of Christ's death until he comes in the future. And we all look forward when we can gather together to share this meal as God's people. Here is the reading. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Here ends this reading. And now the gospel reading. It comes from John's gospel, the 13th chapter, verses 1 to 17 and 31b to 35. And this is the story of the Last Supper. In John's gospel, it recalls a remarkable event that's not really mentioned anywhere else. Jesus performs the duty of a slave, washing the feet of the disciples, and then urging them to do the same for one another. And now the reading. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table. He took off his outer robe and he tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know what I'm going to do now, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew that who was to betray him, and for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put his robe on and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your teacher and your Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed by doing them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, and you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 
So it's the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So just four days ago, Palm Sunday, we recall as we're reading these lessons that Jesus was making his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. And though he was surrounded by the crowds of people who ran alongside the road cheering him and calling him King of the Jews, Jesus rode alone into the city of Jerusalem. Only he knew the ordeals that he must face. Only he knew the suffering and the pain and the death that awaited him. Only he knew what must take place before the week would end. He came to the holy city in, in solitary majesty, alone in the midst of the shouting multitudes. For the road Jesus traveled led not only to a throne, but it also led to a cross. Triumph would despair, turn to despair, and he would go from being a sovereign king to a suffering servant. Each evening through the first days of this week, Jesus walked from Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley into the village of Bethany to spend the night and to rest and to sleep and to renew his strength and to prepare for this ordeal. And each morning, he went back down the mountain and returned to Jerusalem, where he spent the day teaching in the temple. Now, the crowds gathered to be with him, astonished at his wisdom, and they listened intently. He taught with authority and with understanding. And the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, well, they challenged him, but he answered every objection wisely, interpreting the Jewish law with teaching so plain and simple that everyone seemed to understand. He gave them the great commandment. He taught them about social customs and about stewardship and about sacrificial giving. He taught with parables, using everyday stories and situations to insert God's desire for living life in faith. And one evening earlier this week, Jesus was sitting with his friends. He was eating the evening meal. And after a long day of teaching in the temple, and it was at Simon the leper's home, a woman slips into the room and Simon's guests scarcely noticed that she'd come in off the street until she stepped up behind Jesus and she poured an alabaster jar of expensive nard on his head. The diners were shocked and they began to scold her, but Jesus reacted in an opposite way. She had performed this valuable gesture of respect and of honor for which Jesus was profoundly appreciative. What had she done? Jesus realized that she had anointed his body for burial. Now, perhaps Jesus knew that this crucifixion would not be enough time to prepare the body for burial before the beginning of the Sabbath. And so she had done it symbolically, what the women would be unable to do to him before his body was placed in the tomb. And finally, on this night that we celebrate is Monday, Thursday, Jesus has a last supper with his disciples. And I think it was an occasion that was mixed with tension, but also mixed emotions. Judas Iscariot, we know, had decided that he could no longer support Jesus and began making plans to betray him. And that'll play out tonight. And when Jesus announced at the supper that at the supper, one of the 12 would betray him, well, it marked a turning point for the chosen, the initial 12 that would never be together again that way. So in strong contrast to this betrayal that was going on, there was also this solemn observance of the holiest of the Jewish festovers. The meal that recalled the night of the Exodus from Egypt when the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites because of the blood of an innocent lamb that would have been used to smear over the lentils of the doorpost. By the mighty hand of God, the Israelites were set free from their bondage and they were celebrating this story as they had done year after year since the event had happened. They were set free from bondage. They were delivered from slavery. They had set on a journey to a promised land. And so each year the people of Israel gathered then again for the Passover. And tonight, this is what Jesus was celebrating with his disciples. And it's in distributing the bread and the wine that Jesus foreshadows his own sacrificial death and breaking the bread then he solemnly declares this is my body and then passing the cup around he proclaims this is the new covenant of my blood that is poured out for many 
Now, the profound the meaning of this occasion was overshadowed by the death, the impending death. And I'm sure the joy of the occasion was also muted by sorrow and apprehension. So after they leave the room, after the meal, Jesus made two further predictions, which probably increased the tension in the room. First, he predicted that all of the disciples were going to desert him, leaving him to face this ordeal of the passion alone by himself. And secondly, he predicted that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crows. Now, can you imagine yourself in the upper room? How would you have felt if Jesus predicted that you would desert him? He couldn't believe it. From the upper room in the dark night, Jesus leads the disciples to a secluded spot that's in the, the Garden of Gethsemane just outside. And knowing what he must face, he didn't want to begin until he had spent some time with God, his Father. The prayer was a devotional discipline of submission to the will of God and to stay connected. And while there, the disciples fall asleep. And Judas then seizes this opportunity of isolation to lead the Jewish leaders to Jesus so that they can arrest him under the cloak of darkness. And tonight, at this time that we gather from Monday, Thursday, we do this to gather to remember this meal of celebration of God's deliverance, both of the Israelites in Egypt and of humanity on the cross through Jesus Christ. Tonight, we gather, gather to remember the strength that Jesus found in prayer. Moments of devotion spent in the presence of God give us strength, especially during difficult times. And it also gives us guidance and help for living. Tonight, so, we are called to receive strength for our journey. And from the words of Jesus that he gives to us, we are to receive this understanding and affirmation. And we receive strength from the meal in which he promises to be truly present, to provide spiritual strength for our faith journey. And as we do this, we're reminded that not only tonight as we celebrate this, but every day in our life, God continues to fill us with his presence and affirmation and gives us gifts so that we may go into the world, shine and share the light of Christ and be salt in a world that helps to flavor the world with the goodness of Christ. May it be so in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.